This video is sponsored by War Thunder. A strange looking plane nicknamed the Iron Tetpole by the military and an almost forgotten relic of the Cold War and also a hero of several wars, an attack aircraft with the range and armament of a bomber and one of the most technologically advanced planes of its time, which was so good that even the next generation of aircraft could not replace it. Hello Aviator, Sky here and I present to you the great love of sailors, the Grumman A6 Intruder. During World War II, the Navy was one of the main tools of the United States, bringing many victories to the homeland. But after the war, Washington immediately began to cut costs, and it was the Navy that suffered the most. The advent of the atomic bomb made the Air Force, the operator of its carriers, bombers, the most important branch of the armed forces. Besides, the Cold War was looming on the horizon. What good would a Navy do in a war with the continental Soviet Union? The conflict between the Navy, Air Force and the government, by the way, was very serious and was reflected in history as the revolt of the admirals. Read it at your leisure, it's a total Game of Thrones. The sailors were suddenly saved by the Korean War, which quickly showed that firstly, the atomic bomb is not a solution to all problems, and secondly, strategic bombers cannot win the war alone. The Navy and its aviation are still needed. Ironically, Korea also highlighted the problems. First, the advent of gas turbine engines made piston aviation obsolete. Second, existing aircraft, particularly attack aircraft, could not operate at night or in bad weather. This was extremely infuriating for the military, whose plans could be ruined by simple fog. Not to mention soldiers who found themselves in the heat of battle without air support because, you know, it was dark. The Navy, having found a new lease on life, immediately set about solving these problems. The A3 Sky Warrior bombers were responsible for competing with the Air Force monsters and a little later the A5 Vigilante, very cool things that made their owners operators of nuclear weapons. The second question was more difficult. The Navy quickly received a jet attack aircraft, the A4 Skyhawk, which was much better than the old piston planes but was simple and still limited in operations. There was a gap between attack aircraft and bombers. The former could not constantly support troops and the latter would not chase guerrillas through gorges. It was necessary to have something in between, more powerful than the Skyhawk but simpler than the Sky Warrior. A sort of attack aircraft bomber, capable of both covering soldiers and dropping an atomic bomb. And yes, it had to be all weather and able to operate day and night, no more compromises. And to meet these requirements, a new program was initiated in 1955. Eight companies participated in the tender. Boeing, Bell, Douglas, Grumman, North American, Vought, Lockheed and Martin, separately at that point. There were many proposals, some too simple like single-engine attack aircraft, jet and turboprop and some exotic like vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. In the end, the Grumman project turned out to be optimal for the military and it received the contract to create a new machine, which was given the index A2F1. And you can see the results of their work right away by flying and participating in many battles thanks to War Thunder. That's right, in War Thunder, the A6 Intruder takes its rightful place among over 2,500 military legends, aircraft, tanks and ships. You can fly the Intruder on PC, Xbox, PlayStation and mobile devices. And for new players or veterans on PC and consoles who have not been here for more than 6 months, there is a massive bonus pack. It includes a bunch of interesting things, 100,000 silver lions, 7 days of premium account, premium vehicles and an exclusive vehicle decorator, such as the Eagle of Valor. The bonus is available for a limited period, so don't waste time, register using the link in the description, play for free and join a community of over 70 million players worldwide. So what did Grumman offer? Let's take a closer look. The A2F1 is for the most part a classic plane, a twin-engine attack aircraft bomber with a mid-mounted wing, a single tail, subsonic, but with a bunch of interesting solutions. Of course, the plane had to be able to fly quite slowly, both because it needed to operate on aircraft carriers and because it was an attack aircraft. The wing was primarily responsible for these capabilities. It was made quite large with a small sweep, 
folding for compactness on the deck, with small leading edge extensions and a serious set of high lift devices. Very serious. The flaps, for example, were extended so much that there was no room left for ailerons, and spoilers were used to roll the plane. And it worked. The wing could hold a decent bomb load, provided minimum speeds and excellent maneuverability. It was so successful that many of its solutions later migrated to the F-14 Tomcat, also Grumman. As a power plant, it was decided to install on the aircraft two Pratt Whitney J-52 engines with a thrust of about 8,500 pounds force. Initially, it was the engine of the AGM-28 Hound Dog cruise missile, but they took the risk of installing it here. The risk was worth it, the engine showed itself well, and later they began to install it on the A-4 Skyhawk. The engines were placed near the center section, at a slight angle to the fuselage axis with air intakes on the nose. There was also some radicalism. The aircraft was equipped with engines with a thrust vector control. The nozzles could be shifted down by 23 degrees. Not a stovel, of course, but the speed could be reduced even more. At least, that's what it seemed. Finally, the main requirement of the military is round-the-clock and all-weather capability. Here Grumman put the most effort, making their machine for its time incredibly technological. Digital Integrated Attack Navigation Equipment, also known as Diane, was created for the aircraft. Diane was a very sophisticated system, including several radars and transmitters with digital computer control. This is why the aircraft has such a huge nose. Two radars are hidden under the fairing. The system allowed airstrikes to be carried out automatically, according to preset parameters. That is, the aircraft could approach the target, drop bombs and then leave, by itself. A special vertical display indicator was installed in a cockpit, which formed a picture of the terrain and surroundings in poor visibility. In addition, it was equipped with a BACE computer, which performed diagnostics of onboard systems, both in flight and on the ground, increasing reliability and simplifying maintenance. So, here we have computer navigation and weapon control, self-diagnostics and synthetic vision. Synthetic vision. It's the early 1960s. Actually, it wasn't just me who was stunned, but NASA as well. Information about the system was one of the reasons why Grumman was chosen to build the Lunar Excursion Module, the one that landed astronauts on the moon. The control of all this beauty was entrusted to two crew members, who were seated next to each other in the cockpit, like on an F-111 or Su-24. Visibility was excellent, the glazing was made curved like a bubble, and the bombardier slash navigator sitting on the right was moved back and down a little, so as not to block the view of the pilot sitting on the left. The side effect of all this was a huge front of the fuselage, narrowing towards the tail like a teardrop. A prime example of utilitarian design. The plane's appearance is not very stylish, but it gets the job done. Finally, weapons. The plane was supposed to be a hybrid between an attack aircraft and a bomber. It had no armor or integrated cannons, but it could operate at low altitudes and maneuver actively. And it also had a decent range and bomb load. Very decent, with the ability to use various tools, from light missiles to nuclear bombs. I'll talk about the performance a little later. The program developed quite quickly. Already in the spring of 1960, the prototype YA-2F1 made its first flight. But the testing program dragged on, complex onboard equipment took a long time to create, and the flight results forced a change in the design. The aircraft was lengthened, the tail was adjusted, the aerodynamic brakes were moved from the fuselage to the wingtips. And yes, the innovative idea of the thrust vector control of the engines was rejected. It turned out that the reduction in speed was insignificant, and the engines were too complex and heavy. It wasn't worth it. They were replaced with the regular J-52. But even then, the YA-2F1 demonstrated its excellent capabilities. The range was felt best. In 1961, one of the prototypes made a transatlantic flight from the US to France. Right, that's what an attack aircraft does. In 1962, the planes began to be tested at sea, from the deck of the aircraft carrier Enterprise, another new, big, nuclear pride of the Navy. Finally, in early 1963, the aircraft was accepted into service under the name Grumman A6A Intruder. 
It was a breath of fresh air for the military, being in fact the first truly all-weather attack aircraft in the world, without any reservations, although the equipment took some torment at first. The intruder quickly took a worthy place in the fleets of the US Navy and Marine Corps. And as expected, having taken a worthy place, the aircraft quickly received a bunch of nicknames. Drumstick, Iron Tadpole, Double Ugly and the Mighty Alpha 6. Soon the warplane found its war, Vietnam, where it served side by side with the light A-4 Skyhawk and the recently joined A-7 Corsair II. Here, thanks to its capabilities, it was irreplaceable with the corresponding load and risks. The intruder could fly quite low, skirting the terrain below the radar, and strike at distant targets. The Diane system showed itself to be excellent. A side effect, the plane was vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire, which was getting increasingly dense with the Vietnamese. During the entire war, 84 aircraft were lost, of which 56 were shot down by conventional fire from the ground. However, Vietnam was not only a fiery hell for the US military, but also a place where they learned many lessons. This also concerned the evolution of the intruders, which had enormous potential for modification. Having received the A6A, the military almost immediately began to redesign the aircraft to suit their sometimes unexpected needs. For example, one of the strategic problems of the Americans was the famous Ho Chi Minh Trail, along which North Vietnam transferred manpower and weapons. Their night caravans were engaged by the A6C, equipped with containers, cameras and detection systems. Then the Navy began retiring the KA-3B, an aerial tanker based on the A-3 Sky Warrior. It was replaced by the KA-6D, unarmed but effective in aerial refueling. By the 1970s, the Vietnamese had built a fairly powerful air defense network using Soviet S-75 missiles, which became a serious problem for the aviators. To solve this problem, the A-6B variant was created, which was equipped with the AGM-45 Shrike and AGM-78 standard ARM missiles, the target of which were the enemy radars. The war against air defense did not end there. It was necessary not only to attack enemy forces, but also to cover their own. Thus, at the request of the Marines, back in 1963, the EA-6A Electric Intruder was created, an electronic warfare aircraft, which externally differed from the original by the presence of a large instrument container on the vertical stabilizer. But it was an intermediate solution, which became the forerunner of a full-fledged machine. The EA-6B Prowler was much more different from the original. Its cockpit became larger and could accommodate four crew members, a pilot and three systems operators. The aircraft did not carry weapons, but its electronic warfare capabilities increased many times over. It could jam several radars at once, even without entering the air defense zone. The aircraft turned out to be extremely successful, and the demand for it among the military can be described by one number. 170. Considering the narrow specialization of the machine, 170 units is a lot. Lastly, the final version of the attack bomber is the A6E. It received boosted engines and more advanced onboard equipment. A new TREM or target recognition and attack multi-sensor pod appeared here. The now familiar rotating ball with infrared and laser surveillance and targeting devices. This allowed the aircraft to use, among other things, high-precision weapons, such as skipper, harpoon and slam missiles. Over time, the range of weapons grew even more, including most of the existing air-to-surface weapons and even some air-to-air -air missiles. The A6E was the main variant of the intruder family for the next couple of decades, so I guess we can talk about the performance using it as an example. Lengths 16.7 meters, wingspan 16.2 meters. Not a baby, but it shared the deck with bigger machines. Meanwhile, it is quite heavy, with a maximum takeoff weight of 27.4 tons, a couple of tons less than today's Super Hornets. The plane is subsonic, 412 knots cruise, but if you really want to, you can boost to transonic, 560 knots, almost a Mach. Meanwhile, it can climb to an altitude of 42,400 feet. Its minimum speeds are excellent, stall at 93 knots. For such a machine, this is very modest. 
The combat radius is as much as 878 miles at full load. These are its bomber genes. In the Navy, it is unlikely to find such a long-range combat aircraft even now. And for dessert, the intruder received five head points, four under the wing and one under the fuselage. And they could carry as much as 18,000 pounds of weapons. Just so you understand, the B-17, the epic four-engine bomber, the hero of World War II, carried 17,600 pounds. A striking example of the advantages of new designs and jet engines. Actually, after Vietnam, the intruder did not remain idle and participated in, perhaps, all the operations in which its owners participated. Lebanon in 1983. Libya in 1986 and, of course, Iraq in 1991. During the Desert Storm, the A6s flew more than 4,700 combat sorties. They were one of the main platforms for precision strikes. The old guys successfully worked on par with much more modern machines. And after the end of the first round of combat with Saddam Hussein, the A6s managed to fight in Somalia and the Balkans. But despite all the laurels, the intruder was losing the battle against time. It was aging, not so much in concept, it was actively modernized, but physically. Ship-based aircraft are subject to serious loads, and the early A6s, already by the 1980s, began to have problems with their service life. The aircraft's wings began to be replaced with new, composite ones. But this solved the problem only partially, because after the obsolete wing came the time of obsolete fuselages. Grumman also offered more radical upgrades. The A6F Intruder II was to receive many improvements. First of all, replacing the old J-52 engines with the brand new F-404s. But despite the fact that the project reached the prototype stage, the military showed no interest. They were all thinking about a new wonder weapon, the A-12 Avenger II, a stealth flying wing aircraft. The Avenger II, having absorbed several billion dollars, was never born. But by the time this became clear, the era of the A6 was over, and they did not develop it further. In the 1990s, most of the fleet was retired. The EA-6B Prowlers lasted the longest, serving into the 21st century. But they too were replaced by the EA-18G Growler, an aircraft with the same role, based on the FA-18E Super Hornet. The A6 Intruder was produced from 1962 to 1992 with a total of 693 aircraft delivered. Not a huge number, but given its specificity, service in only two branches of the armed forces without export, and the fact that the 1960s aircraft was being made for 30 years, we can say that it definitely deserved its place in history. And now, knowing everything about the intruder, you're ready for battle. Make sure to check out War Thunder now for free on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, or on mobile. And use my links in the video description to register. Those of you who are new or haven't played for six months will also receive a massive bonus pack across PC and console, including multiple premium vehicles, in-game currency, and more. Like and subscribe to the channel so as not to miss new aviation adventures, fast flights, and soft landings to you.